Hi, welcome back. In this session, I want to focus on the third component of corporate finance. The last two sessions, I've talked about the investment decision and the financing decision. And in this one, I want to talk about the dividend decision. To start this process off, I want to, ask, to talk about how much a company can return to its shareholders. That's basically what the dividend decision measures. And the way we measure it is very simple. We start with net income, which is a measure of equity income. We subtract out what companies put back into the business. We call it reinvestment. But to measure that reinvestment, we look at capital expenditures, which is investment in long-term assets. We net out depreciation against that. And we also include change in working capital. Investing more in inventory receivables reduces your cash flow. So net income, we subtract out the reinvestment. And then to get to what equity investors can do, we also have to deal with cash flows to and from debt. Cash flows to debt will be repaying debt. Cash flows from debt will be taking on new debt. That net cash flow can sometimes increase cash flows to equity investors if you're borrowing more than you're repaying, but can also reduce cash flows if you're repaying more than you're borrowing. What you're left with is called free cash flow equity or potential dividend. You can already see that that number can be negative. Why might it be negative? Maybe you're a money losing company and net income was negative. You start with a negative number. But even if you're a money making company, your free cash or equity can be negative. If you're reinvesting a lot, you're a high growth company, or you have lots of debt payments to you, a very heavily leveraged company. But it's good to have that measure of what a company can pay out. So let me give you some examples of free cash or equity across the life cycle. I'm looking at Airbnb, Adobe, and Kraft Times again. Companies are looked at in the context of the financing mix. And I've computed the free cash flow equity in their most recent year, which I think was 2021, at least in this example. For Air, all three, if, if you look across companies, Airbnb starts with a negative number, minus 352 million, their money losing. And even though their depreciation exceeds their capex, partly because their capex doesn't, does, their capex does not incorporate their biggest reinvestment, which is an R and D, which is treated as an operating expense, the net free cash flow equity that I end up with for Airbnb is a negative number, minus one hundred nine million. You're saying, what does that tell me? If you ask me, how much can an Airbnb return to its shareholders in 2021? The answer is they cannot afford to return any cash because they're already in the hole. Adobe has net income of 4.8 million after you add back depreciation, subtract capex and take into account the debt payments. Your free cash flow equity is 3.322 billion. At least they can afford to return 3.22 billion. Whether they do or not is a different question. Kraft Heinz starts with lower net income than Adobe, but because they're barely reinvesting, and they're, in fact, divesting assets. The divestitures create five billion, which is not uncommon for a declining firm. You end up with a free cash flow equity of 3.2 billion. So your free cash flow equity is going to be affected by where in the life cycle because of the level of net income, the reinvestment you have to make, and the debt payments coming due. But that free cash flow equity measures how much each of these companies could have returned to their shareholders. Now, as you look at the components that go into free cash flow equity, it's worth noting that that free cash flow equity will change as companies age. I've taken one example here. It's anecdotal, just a single company, so take it for what it's worth. I computed the net income and the free cash flow equity for Tesla going back to their starting year as a company. For much of their existence, in fact, for the first 12 years of Tesla's existence, the free cash flow equity were negative because your net income was negative and you were reinvesting for growth. Finally, if you look at 2020, their net income turned positive, but the free cash flow equity was close to zero. So even though their earnings turned positive, the free cash flow equity was still not there because they were still reinvesting. You look at 2021, for the first time you have positive free cash flow equity, it still lags the net income. I'll wager if you project this graph out for the next 20 years of Tesla's existence and Tesla stays a successful company, you're going to start to see free cash or equity start to catch up with net income. So early in the life cycle, free cash flows equity and net income will be negative. If the company makes it through the growth phase, you should expect to see net income turn positive first, then free cash flows equity turn positive. Net income to run ahead of free cash flow equity when the company is growing. And as the company matures, the two companies, the two numbers will, will start to converge. 
And when it goes into decline, your free cash or equity will actually exceed your net income, which was the case with Kraft Heinz. So one way you can measure where your company's in the life cycle is actually by computing the net income and free cash or equity. So I'm going to look across the life cycle on each of these components that go into free cash or equity. Let's start with net income. Looking across the life cycle, across all global companies from youngest to oldest, you can see that the, and this is a statistic I had pointed to earlier, more, about 73% of young companies are money losing. That's, that percentage drops off as companies mature. So if you look at the oldest companies, less than 9% are money losing. The youngest companies, 70, you're saying, so what? Remember, you start free cash direct with your negative net income. It becomes much more difficult to climb out of that pit you've dug for yourself. So young companies often start with negative net income. If you look at reinvestment, you know, and you can look at net capex and change in working capital. And again, to scale it, I've scaled it to, you know, as a person of revenues. And, uh, and as you look as a person of revenues, you look at the youngest companies, they tend to have much more reinvestment needs because they're trying to grow close to 10%. As companies age, that percentage drops off. So your net income is more likely to be negative if you're a younger company. Your reinvestment is likely to be greater. And finally, if you look at debt cash flows, young companies, and you saw this in the, in the previous section, tend not to borrow money. There's not much in terms of debt cash flows. But as you age as a company, you're going to see it become a much bigger player in the game. And in fact, in many cases, you might be repaying debt in some cases or taking on debt. The net effect of all of these things playing out is you're more likely to see negative free cash flows to equity early in the life cycle. And in fact, that's what you see on this table. The youngest companies have a much higher percentage of companies with negative free cash flow equity, 76% of all young companies have negative free cash flow equity. Older companies, it's only 27%. Remember, free cash flow equity is what you can afford to return. And clearly, younger companies are less able to return cash than older companies. Again, it makes complete sense, but it's good to see the numbers back that up. So let's talk about cash return. First, assume that you have the cash to return, right? If you have the cash to return, which is more likely to be the case if you're an older than a younger company, you have a choice. You can either pay it out as dividend, which for much, much of public company existence has been the primary way of returning cash, or you can buy back stock. The problem with dividends is, for better or worse, they've become sticky in much of the world. What does that mean? When companies start to pay dividends, they feel reluctant, especially to cut dividends, and they try to stay pretty close to what they paid as dividends last year. In this graph, I've looked at the percent, percentage of U.S. companies that increase dividends, that's a green column, the percent of companies that cut dividends, that's red. And already, if I stop there, you can see that far more companies increase than decrease dividends. But I've also, in the blue column, listed out the percentage of companies that do nothing to dividends, pay what they did last year. And guess what? In every single year, the companies that do change, leave dividends at what they were the previous year exceeds the number of companies that change dividends. Dividends are sticky. When companies start to pay dividends, they feel obligated to keep paying them in good times and in bad, in health and in sickness. And that can be a problem with dividends. The alternative dividends is buybacks. And let me be very clear, dividends and buybacks have exactly the same effect on the companies. Both cause cash to leave the company. Both have to be funded, sometimes with, with retained earnings, sometimes with debt. Both have effectively the same consequence for companies. From the company's perspective, there's really no difference between paying out three billion in dividends and three billion in buybacks. But there is a difference to investors on two dimensions. One is dividends go to all shareholders in the company. Buybacks are selective. They go only to those shareholders who sell their shares back. That sounds unfair, right? You're saying, what if I don't want to sell my shares back? You get price appreciation instead. Buybacks also are not sticky. We talked a little bit about this in, in, in the session where I laid out the big picture of corporate finance. Buybacks are, buybacks are flexible. When a company has a lot of cash, it can buy back stock, but it's not obligated to keep buying back stocks. I think of buybacks as flexible dividends. And from that perspective, that might play out in which one's right for you as a company, depending on where you're in the life cycle. 
So dividends and buybacks are in a sense equivalent for companies, the difference being buybacks are more flexible than dividends. And that perhaps plays out in explaining what you see in this chart. This looks at dividends and buybacks of all US companies starting in the 1980s going through 2021. And over time, the trend line is clear. US companies are increasingly shifting away from dividends to buybacks. And one reason I think is the desire for flexibility, to be able to adjust what you return each year based on how well or badly you're doing that year. Now that's not a phenomenon that just restricted the US. You're starting to see it show up across the world, albeit at different rates. Africa and, Latin and the Middle East, it's still a very low percentage buybacks are a very low percent of cash return. Look at Canada, you look at Japan, you look at Europe. You're seeing a significant amount of cash returned by companies take the form of buybacks. So again, remember, dividends and buybacks both have the same effect on the company in terms of cash leaving the company, but buybacks are flexible, dividends tend to be rigid, and that's driving why companies are shifting away from dividends to buybacks. Now, if you look at cash return choices across the life cycle, We've already laid the foundations for what you're going to see in this table when we looked at the free cash flow equity of potential dividends across companies across the life cycle. If you remember that table, just a few, pay, just a few, you know, few slides back, young companies tended to have more negative free cash flow equity. 76% of young companies had negative free cash flow equity. More mature companies were more likely to have positive free cash flow equity. Free cash return equity, of course, is potential dividends. And if you look at the actual cash return at companies, it kind of reflects what you saw with potential dividends. Only about 31% of young companies return cash to their shareholders. But if you look at the oldest companies, that number is 84%. Far more older companies return cash to shareholders than younger companies. Kind of makes sense, right? And when young companies do choose to return cash, they're more likely to use buybacks than dividends. Again, makes sense. Young companies face uncertainty about the future. They're more likely to adopt a flexible way of returning cash rather than a rigid way. Having said all of this about dividends and buybacks, you know, I've described the, you know, I've described both dividends and buybacks in terms of residual cash flows, what's left over after you've met every conceivable need. And if companies are healthy, that's the way they should be setting dividend policy. So in a, in a, in a world with healthy companies, you'd start with taking projects, you'd make a choice on financing mix, and then at the end of the process, what's left as cash flows, you can choose to return as dividends or buybacks. But in reality, there are companies which adopt what I think of as dysfunctional dividend policies, where they start with what they want to pay out, dividends or in buybacks, and then they work backwards from there. They decide how much to borrow, and then they also decide what projects to take. It's not healthy because now dividend policy is driving how these companies finance themselves or take projects, but there are lots of companies that do it. To close the cycle here, I want to look at what happens when companies choose not to return their potential dividend. Free cash or equity is potential dividend, and dividends and buybacks are what they actually return. Do companies actually return what they should? The answer when you look globally is no. In fact, this is from 2021. I looked at every company, every publicly traded company's free cash or equity, and I looked at what these companies returned as cash. Across all global companies in 2021, about 37% of global companies returned less cash than they had available as free cash or equity. Think of those as cash accumulators, and 63% paid out more cash than they had available in free cash or equity. Think of them as cash burners. And you can see the statistics vary across parts of the world, but in any given year, you can take it almost as a given that most companies will return, will choose to return cash that doesn't match up to what they could have returned as their free cash or equity. You say, what happens then? The answer is pretty obvious. If a company returns exactly its free cash or equity, its cash balance stays stagnant. If a company consistently returns less cash than it has available as free cash or equity, then its cash balance will go up because that difference goes into your cash balance. If a company consistently returns more cash than its free cash or equity, it's burning through cash if it has cash. And if it runs out of cash, it has to raise fresh equity of, you know, so essentially 
when you see a company have ca a return cash that's different from the free cash record, you can work through the consequences. So let's say you're looking at a company which has chosen not to return cash even though they have free cash or equity. Its cash balance will go up and it'll get larger and you're saying, so what? Well, it depends on what shareholders in your company think about that cash balance and it turns out that shareholders are discriminating. What does that mean? They don't treat all companies the same when it comes to cash accumulation. There are some companies where they seem to be okay with the company accumulating cash and other companies where they're not okay. They push for those cash, that cash to be returned. And it all boils down to trust. And here's why. If you're an investor in a company that has a large amount of cash that it's accumulated, you worry about what managers will do with the cash. If you trust managers, you can let them hold the cash. But if you don't, you're going to push for the cash to be returned. In fact, this is from a study that looked across all companies and looked to see what a dollar in cash is valued at in the hands of a company. And it looked at, you know, growth companies based on volatility, based on leverage. And the answer is a dollar in cash is sometimes valued more than a dollar in the hands of some companies and less than a dollar in other companies. Let's tie this to the life cycle. Now, I think that young companies, when they accumulate cash, Comp investors treat that cash with more grace. They give the company more slack. In other words, with young companies accumulating cash, investors might say, that's okay. No, I'm okay with you accumulating the cash. More mature companies accumulating cash, you're more likely to get pushed back. And we'll tie this in later when we talk about activist investors targeting these companies for cash return. But part of it comes from this accumulation of cash, which in turn comes from dividend policy. So this stage, we're in a position to tie everything together in the life cycle. If you look across the life cycle on earnings, you tend to have negative earnings, more likely to have negative earnings at young companies and positive earnings at more mature companies, and then declining earnings and declining companies. In terms of reinvestment, you're more likely to have high reinvestment at young companies, which in you know, conjunction with the negative earnings will give you negative free cash flow equity. With mature companies, you're more likely to see reinvestment drop off, which is part of the reason mature companies are where you get the biggest positive free cash flow equity. And then you're going to decline. While your operations might lead to lower you know, free cash flow equity, you can now supplement it by, div by divesting assets. You're a shrinking company. So if you look at free cash flow equity across the life cycle, young companies tend to have negative free cash flow equity. They're therefore not in a great position to return cash. And if they are in a position to return cash, they're more likely to use buybacks, which are flexible ways <clears throat> of returning cash than dividends. More mature companies, much better candidates for dividends. When you're going to decline, again, you might shift back to buybacks because your cash flows become more unpredictable. You can see why life cycle and dividend policy are kind of linked up. I hope you found the session useful, and I thank you very much for listening.